All right, folks, I guess we're going to go ahead and get started then. Um, thank you very much for coming out to our presentation this morning, uh, Extending Barbican, Managing Secrets in a Venture Away. Um, let's go ahead and start off with uh, kind of an introduction of our presenters today, um, starting with Ade. So my name is uh, Adi Lee. Um, I'm, uh, oh, thank you. There you go. Uh, my name is Adi Lee. I'm uh, the project lead for the dog tag certificate system, which is the upstream version of the Red Hat certificate system. Um, dog tag uh, has the ability to store secrets and issue certificates, which is exactly what Barbican does. So, uh, us working together, uh, it was a perfect, perfect fit. And I've been working with the Barbican group for about a year or so now, uh, one of the Barbican cores, and um, uh, working mostly with uh, working with the upgrade, with the uh, plugin framework, which we're gonna talk about today. Um, and the certificate flows. So. Cool. All right. Uh, I'm Nate Reller. <laughs> yeah. I'm Nate Reller. I'm not Joel. Joel's here somewhere. Uh, so I'm Nate Reller. I'm from APL. That's the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, if you're not into that whole brevity thing. Um, so APL is a research organization. Uh, we're what's called the University Affiliated Research Center. Uh, we have research in many different areas. Uh, we have two spacecrafts that are mapping out the sun. We have another on the way to Pluto. Uh, a little closer to home, we have uh, prosthetic limb research as well as cybersecurity, and that's my group. Uh, in particular, my team is working on OpenStack, and our goal is simple. We just want to improve the security of OpenStack. Um, so we've been involved with OpenStack for over two years now. A couple of features you might be familiar with are the center volume encryption. We added that in Havana, as well as the ephemeral encryption. And of course, if you have encryption, you need secure key management. So that's what brought us together uh, with Barbican. All right, so I'm Paul Kerr, and I do uh, cryptography work for Rexspace, and I'm actually uh, operating on about one hour of sleep in the last 27, so I'm going to be mostly watching from the audience. Uh, but I uh, worked a lot on the uh, PKCS11 plugin that they'll be talking about here, and uh, in general, I've been, done a lot of work on the plugin infrastructure. So if you want to hear me ramble incoherently after the talk, you're welcome to come and ask me questions. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I'll do my best to, to go through his slides, but if I say anything wrong, he can bump me over the head. Uh, so my name is John Wood. I'm also with Rack Rackspace. And, uh, so my history on the project is I was the first, I guess, uh, uh, developer on the project um, after, after Jarrett. So Jarrett Rame had this idea a number, you know, maybe a year or two before I started on the project. And uh, once he finally was able to form a team with uh, Andrew Hartnett, um, they, they brought me on to try to set up the project, get it off the ground. And uh, the idea was to try to get something ready in front of the Portland conference. So we're talking, you know, almost two years ago next year. Um, and try to get something where people could evaluate the API and all that on their, on their local machines. And then I would say, you know, uh, probably around that time is when Douglas Mendizabal came on board, the PTL of Barbican, and so it's been growing ever since. So um, if, there, if you don't like the structure of, of the project, please see me for complaints, you know. Um, otherwise, I'd say let's go ahead and start on our, our presentation today. So what is Barbican um, beyond a medieval fortification and defense in front of a castle. Um, it is also an OpenStack compliant secrets management service. I'm gonna try this, this cool thing out here. There is some integration underway. This is just uh, some of the integration work that's going on. We also have scheduled tomorrow a design summit session uh, where we invite people that are interested to integrate with Barbican to come. Um, I'll, I'll show a slide at the very end of the presentation with all the, the schedule for those presentations. And finally, there's a plugin approach that we use to extend features in Barbican, which is obviously going to be the, the focus of, of the presentation this morning. So big picture view, uh, just to give people an idea of, of what we're talking about here. Um, we have clients that wish to use Barbican. Those could be other OpenStack projects or, or just clients in general wishing to store and retrieve secrets out of Barbican. Um, we have Keystone for, for authentication and authorization. Um, and then Barbican Core, we'll re be referring all throughout the presentation to Barbican Core. And that's, that's the API front end of Barbican, that's the, the business logic of Barbican, if you will. Um, everything that's not plugins. And so 
Um, there's a certain amount of feature set then that we, we want the plugins to deliver. And so Barbican Core will work with those plugins through a contract which we'll be describing um, to, to, to make those things happen. And so then you have your basic plugin, you have a variety of implementations that are available once you have a plugin contract in place. And once you have that, that uh, interaction going, um, then you can start to use Barbican in your system. So you can have clients working with Keystone to get their tokens. Then they can make their REST calls to Barbican. Barbican Core will then um, work with Keystone to verify that token and, and collect the, uh, the role information applied against the policies. And, and if all that uh, passes, then Barbican can work with that plugin to do its thing. Plugin can do whatever is required behind that interface. It responds with, with its result, and Barbican can respond back to the client. And so once you have that interaction in place, once you have that contract defined, well, then you can start making other plugins that fit into that same contract. So more plugins, more better. That's kind of the approach. And so if you start looking at a contract, it's basically just a, a, uh, an abstract method, or abstract class, that is, with abstract methods that uh, plugin implementations would extend. And so configuration, we're using Steve Door to, to, to pull those plugins in and use them. And you can see a basic configuration would have namespace and a, an actual implementation class defined. And that's how these things are looked up within the code. So when you have a plugin installed and, you, and, and you're ready to use it, you can configure its behavior by presenting in the Barbican config file a group of, of configuration uh, specific for that plugin. So every plugin can have its own group of, of configuration items within that config file. And the idea being you can use Chef or, or some other configuration management to, to actually supply things like passwords out of encrypted data bags and so forth. And so this is kind of the, the landscape of the plugins so far for, for, for Barbican. And uh, so just briefly on the left hand side we have the secret store interface which is our basic um, secret storage and retrieval mechanism within Barbican. Within that, the, a subset of, of that secret store is HSM style plugins, or crypto plugins we call them in the code base. And these are plugins that specialize in encryption and decryption of secrets, but they don't, they, they don't themselves store those secrets. So Barbican Core stores the encrypted secret on, on those, those plugins behalf. Then we have uh, what we call certificate or C, you know, certificate plugins that work with CAs typically. They don't have to. Uh, but the idea there is Barbican Core <coughs> and those plugins work together to, to, to drive certificate generation workflows. And finally, we'll touch on the uh, eventing plugin structure that, that we're, we're trying to get uh, working within Barbican. There's still there's some early work on that. So with that, I'll hand this over to Nate to talk about the secret store plugins. All right, so I'm going to talk about the secret store plugins within Barbican. What's cool about the secret store plugin is this is what you can use to configure how you want your secrets to be managed by Barbican. So for example, some of you may have requirements for uh, how your secrets need to be stored. So for example, uh, some people have requirements that their encryption keys need to be created and stored on a FIPS compliant device that's tamper proof and has some uh, auditing capabilities. So if that's the case and your device is KMIP compliant, you can configure Barbican to talk to that device using the KMIP secret store. Uh, if it's not KMIP compliant, we have a couple other secret stores that may work for you. And if those don't work, you can always write your own. And I have a couple slides at the end that show how easy it is to do that. So now I'm going to give you a little bit more context for the secret stores, show how they fit in with Barbican itself, and then within uh, OpenStack in general. Um, so as John mentioned earlier, there's Barbican Core. Uh, what that provides is the RESTful API and the access control for all your secrets. And the API for uh, Barbican Core has the basic methods for secrets, so creating, reading, updating, and deleting secrets. And if you look at the interface for the secret store, it's very similar. It has create, read, update, and delete methods for secrets. The big difference is the Barbican core uh, takes in the keystone token, and, and it needs that for the access control. So the basic relationship here is 
Barbara King Core receives it, does the access control, and then de delegates that method off to some secret store. So we'll go ahead and look at an example to show the sequence of events for how this would work. Uh, so we'll, we'll use uh, the sender volume encryption feature for that. Uh, so we'll start off on the top left up there with uh, Nova, that's the client. So with uh, sender volume encryption, what uh, Nova needs to do is it needs to get the encryption key for the sender volume. Uh, so what it does is it talks to the key manager interface, that's an interface that's within Nova, and uh, we have a patch out there for a Barbican implementation of that key manager interface. So if you like that patch, please give us a plus one. Uh, but hopefully that should be in soon, and what will happen is Nova will make a request to Barbican and say, please give me this particular key so I can do the encryption. At that point, Barbican Core receives that request. It does the access control checks uh, using Keystone. If everything goes, uh, goes well and it's authorized to use that key, it then calls the secret store and says, secret store, please give me this key. At that point, the secret store then does whatever it needs to do to retrieve that key. In the case of the KMIP secret store, what it does is it actually makes a call out to an external KMIP server. That KMIP server will return the key to the secret store. Secret store passes it back up to KMIP core, KMIP, or sorry, Barbican core, and then Barbican core passes it back to Nova. At that point, Nova has the key, and then it can set up DMcrypt and set up uh, the encrypted sender volume. So we created the secret store interface in the Juno release, um, and we also created some implementations of it. So there's the hardware security module. This is the Barbican HSM uh, secret store. So John is going to talk about this one next, so I'm not going to go into too much there. There is the KMIP secret store, which is the key management interoperability protocol. That's an OASIS standard for talking to uh, key management devices. And the third one that we have is the dog tag secret store. So this is the one that a day developed, and this talks to a dog tag server. So this slide here, just uh, this lists the methods that are required for a secret store implementation. So I'll go over these real quick, just to give you an idea of what needs to be there. Uh, there are two supports methods. Uh, so what happens uh, when Barbican Core receives a request, the first thing it needs to do is make sure that the secret store can satisfy that request. So there are a couple supports methods there for that. Um, so it just basically checks, hey, can you generate a AES-256 key for me, or can you generate asymmetric keys for me? Um, so it does that check first just to make sure that it can satisfy the request. There's store secret, so if you have an existing key that you want to store, it would call this. Uh, there's get secret. Um, then we have a couple of generate methods. So generate symmetric key and generate asymmetric key. Um, so sometimes the user just wants you to create that key for them. That's what these methods are for. And then we also have get transport key. This one I'm not going to go into too much detail. I think Adi may touch on it briefly. Um, but essentially what this does is this allows the client, um, in our previous example that was Nova, you can wrap the key between the client and the external server if you'd like. Um, this way Barbican cannot see that uh, your secret while it's in transit through it. Alright. So now I'm going to have two slides on secret stores and actually how you would go about implementing uh, a secret store if you would like. Um, so I envision most secret stores uh, are going to be uh, adapters. So they're going to call out to some external piece of hardware for the storage of their keys. Um, so this is how the KMIP and the dog tag secret stores actually work. So essentially all you're doing is wrapping the interface that is provided by your back-end device to what is provided by the, the secret store interface. Um, so if we take a look at the table here, this shows the secret store method and the corresponding KMIP method, so you can see how they map nicely together. So generate symmetric key calls create in the KMIP method. Similar for asymmetric key and create key pair, and so on and so forth. So if you look through the code for um, the KMIP and the dog tag secret store, all you do is you get the request, you have the Barbican objects, you then translate those to your backend device objects, you open a socket, send the message request across, and then you wait for the result. 
So the result, the result is uh, the only part that may be a little unexpected. So if you notice for each time, each of the methods that generates a new key, uh, this will be like generate symmetric, generate asymmetric, and store key. The return value of that is uh, what we call secret metadata. And this is just a dictionary. It can contain whatever you like. In most cases, what it will be is it will actually contain the ID that is from the uh, external device that's storing your keys. So essentially what you're doing is you're creating a mapping from the Barbican ID to your backend appliance ID. Um, and then that metadata is then passed to subsequent calls to retrieve, update, or delete that key. So here you can see this is actually the return value for the KMIP secret store when you generate a symmetric key. And then when you um, call get key, for example, or delete key, this is passed in. You look through the dictionary, make sure the UUID is there, and that's what the, the UUID you would pass to the KMIP device. Oh. So that's all I have for the secret store, so I'll hand it over. Thank you, Nate. So the next, uh, next plug-in that we were going to focus on was the HSM style. And again, I'm speaking on behalf of, of Paul, who has very little sleep in the last uh, day or so. Um, so like I said, if I, if I say something wrong, feel free to throw something at me. Rotten tomatoes or whatever. I know you have some in that backpack there. So uh, let's see. So an overview. So as I mentioned before, the HSM plugin performs encryption, decryption. It can also generate um, secrets. But uh, it doesn't actually store the, the secret information. So it uses uh, key encryption keys, or KECs, that we'll call, you know, that we'll use that acronym um, all throughout the rest of the presentation. Uses those KECs to actually encrypt those secrets. And so Barbican stores that information in its own database. And then, as, as uh, Nate mentioned, there is an adapter plugin to adapt the secret store plugins to the HSM style plugins. And the actual implementation we have available now with the code base is a PKCS11 based interface uh, using that protocol and it, it's talking to a safe net HSM but uh, you know you could you, it wouldn't take much trouble to, to get a, a PKCS11 based HSM to work with that. I will note that throughout the rest of the presentation as well we're using P11 as the shorthand for that. In fact if you look at the code base you'll see P11 um, referring to that. There is a team also working on an HP Atala uh, HSM interface. So the contract for HSM plugins then uh, starts with a uh, crypto plugin base uh, uh, abstract class. And there's the familiar supports method to determine which plugins to actually use. There's a bind kek metadata method that we'll go into on the next slide in more detail. But the idea is that each project has its own key encryption key. And this is an opportunity for the plugin to establish that key and whatever mechanism that it needs to, to, to do. And we'll show the P11 example in a second. Encrypt and decrypt, you know, your basic operations for HSM, you would expect those to be on there. And then two generate methods, one for symmetric, one for asymmetric keys. Very similar to the uh, secret store. So if we look at what the P11 plugin then is doing currently, um, it establishes a master encryption key within the, the HSM. And the idea is that's going to be used to wrap project key encryption keys. And, uh, and so the idea is these, these project, project keys are actually going to be doing the, the encryption process. And so we also have an HMAC that's being established, and that's being used to verify that encrypted project keg. So as it turns out, both those, those pieces of information are going to be stored in Barbican, but the MEC and HMAC itself will be established on the HSM and never leave the HSM. So if you look at the process then, we have Barbican Core on the left-hand side, and it's uh, the Barbican database. And then we have our plugin in the center there, P11 plugin, and then the HSM that it's interfacing with. And so as I mentioned, the, the MEC and the HMAC are established in that, H, in that HSM. And so when Barbican Core is ready to call that bind process, and again, that bind process will be called every time a secret process is encountered for a project ID that hasn't been seen yet. So once that project ID is established, it won't do this again. And so the P11 plugin orchestrates with the HSM to create that keck. The master encryption key then is used to wrap that keck, and an HMAC process is, is run 
to, to aid in verifying that project keck later. And so that produces your wrapped keck and the HMAC result. Both those pieces of information are passed back to Barbican Core and stored in its database. So that, like I said, that, that's gonna be, once that's established, that will be reused for all operations with that project from now on. And so as a, it's kind of a anecdote, um, I would also mention you have to be, this is, this is gonna kind of lead into a conversation we'll have a little bit later about plug-in versioning, okay? So we, what we ended up doing originally, we were putting these project level KECs right in the HSM. And the problem there is for the HSMs we're using at Rackspace anyway, there wasn't going to be enough space to store all the projects that we were going to uh, support, be supporting uh, secret storage for. So Paul ended up changing his original design to use the master key encryption approach. So that was the wrapped Keck approach that we just discussed. And so the good news is the contract didn't need to change. Um, Barbican, the bind, the, the bind Keck results are stored into Barbican's Keck database and everything's fine, you know, I mean, it, that's, that's how it works. Uh, the plugin determines what that, that, that uh, metadata looks like and Barbican stores it on the behalf of that, that plugin and hands it back to the plugin. So that was good, but the problem is the semantics changed, right? So um, now we were putting wrapped Keck information, that encrypted Keck information for the projects into that metadata when before we weren't. And so that means when we tried to retrieve secrets using that old style, well obviously that data was missing and, and we effectively broke retrieving those old secrets. So even though we were using the same plugin by name and that information is recorded on the metadata, the information put into that metadata changed and that was enough to wreck things. So um, as I mentioned, there's gonna be a design summit to, to kind of dive into that and, and try to standardize ways to control that probably through versioning. So if we move on to encryption then, um, as I mentioned before, we have our project Keck wrapped in the Barbican database and we have our, our MEC and HMAC. And so this is the starting point for, for your, uh, your operations. And so the, sec the secret is provided by the client through the API. And so Barbican Core re uh, retrieves the project Keck for that, sends that over to the P11, who then orchestrates with the HSM to place that information into the HSM. So the wrapped Keck shows up there the HMAC then is used to verify it based on the, the HMAC uh, results that were stored when the Keck was created in the first place. And then that's unwrapped by the MEC, and then that unwrapped Keck is used to encrypt the secret. And so that's passed back out and then stored into the Barbican database. So this is, in essence, where your encrypted data, encrypted secrets come from in this process. So if we move on to decrypt, well, you know, it's, as, as you might imagine, it's a reverse process. So when you're ready to encrypt a particular secret, you, uh, you, you pull those pieces of information, the project, the, the wrapped project cake and the encrypted secret, pass that along back to the HSM. Same sort of HMAC verification and unwrapping process goes on, and that unwrapped keck then is used to decrypt that secret, which is passed back out to Barbican Core and is returned back to the client. So generation, um, I'm not gonna go into too many details on generation, it's, it's a fairly simple process. Um, as you can imagine, the wrapped Keck and HMAC are always the inputs to these processes, you know, once that's established. Um, that's kind of a familiar, familiar pattern. But then for generation, you have to provide, the client would have to provide through the ordering process what the actual secret that they want to, uh, to generate is, bit length, algorithm, et cetera. So that information is provided and then the HSM will actually generate the random bits for, for symmetric, it's, it's relatively easy to do that. And then the encrypt process that we just talked about is, is run on top of that. So just a configuration example then, um, you can see we have you know, the, the things you would expect out there, a login, password, uh, you, you can also see the, the MCAC label and HMAC label, the labels are how Barbican refers to the information that's in those HSMs. The, 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 the HMAC and the MEC that never leave the HSM are still referred to via these labels. So, so Barbican Core and the plugins can access those. And so again, this would be something that, that your configuration management would override those values as needed for your environments. And with that, I will pass along to Ade here, talking about the certificate plugins. Okay, so um, certificate plugins. There we go. 
Um, so of course, certificate plugin is just basically the plugin that interacts with the certificate authorities uh, to do uh, certificates for X509 for X509 certificates for PKI. Um, currently, for uh, Juno, there were two plugins that were written: Dogtag and Semantic. Uh, for Kilo, there is a Digicert Digi plugin that's being uh, currently in production. Uh, the current planned use of the OpenStack is uh, the load balance as a service for Neutron. Um, Adam Harwell and, and his guys have been working pretty hard on, on getting Barbican uh, in there. But of course, there are lots of possible future use cases. Um, any uh, OpenStack service that needs uh, SSL server certs or needs uh, uh, user certs, but, uh, potentially uh, signing certs like Keystone tokens or something like that for PKI, uh, those are all possible play things that could be done. So uh, the contract is pretty straightforward of, for the certificate plugin. You have uh, some support, you know, basically the same kind of methods. So you're going to see the same kind of supports methods that you've seen in the other plugins as well too. So this would be, for example, where you'd say whether or not your CA supports generating an ECC certificate or certificate with a certain uh, key size or whatever the case may be, or extensions or whatever. Um, Issue certificate request is going to be the call that uh, you're going to use to um, talk to your particular CA and start the enrollment process for getting a certificate coming out of it. Um, and that could ultimately return either a certificate automatically, if it's automatically approved, or um, it could return a status that says, you know, basically we're waiting for the approval on, on the CA side. Um, and so if you, if you don't have a certificate that's already approved there, you can of course always either modify or cancel the certificate request. Um, and then ultimately, you're going to want to check the status of that certificate request um, to make sure that you know when when you get a cert, when you get a cert, it's going to be returned, and then it'll be returned back to Mobile Weekend Core. So then, these are the methods that would be need to be implemented by a plugin. Um, so they're pretty straightforward. Um, they all take three uh, three parameters because the certificate plugin comes in through the order interface in the Barbican API, and then you're going to have you're going to have an order essentially associated with it, so there's an order ID. The order metadata is going to contain all the things that you need uh, to specify what kind of certificate you want. Uh, so things like the CSR or the, um, uh, uh, the requester ID or something like that. The plugin meta um, has the same sort of uh, role as Nate mentioned in the uh, secret store. Uh, it's basically uh, a dictionary that's used by the plugin um, to store any data that it needs in order to keep track of the state of the certificate request. So uh, obviously for issue certificate request, one thing you're going to want is the ID of that request on your, on your CA so that when you check the status at a later point in time, you have that ID ready to, to go ahead and check. Um, it's going to return a result object called the result DTO, data, data transfer object, which essentially is just going to have the status, the certificate, any intermediate certificates, retry parameters, that kind of thing. So just to kind of see how this, this would work, um, you, uh, you, some client is going to make a post to orders. So that's uh, Neutron over there. Uh, load balancer is going to make a, a post to slash orders. It's going to, the body of that request is going to include all of the relevant parameters that you're going to need uh, to make the request. Um, so the CSR and so on. All of those are going to be stored in the order metadata. Um, and an order ID is going to be returned to the client. Um, at that point, a certificate task is going to be queued. And once it is executed, um, a CA plugin is going to be selected by going through all of the plugins and, and you know, going through and specifying the supports methods and so on. Um, loaded by Stevedore, and then uh, we're going to call uh, issue certificate request on that plugin, which is going to make, translate that into a CA-specific API call um, to generate your certificate request on that certificate authority. Now, at that point, Certificate authority is going to return a status. Um, it could be pending. It could have the cert itself. Um, that is going to be a CA-specific type of uh, output, which will then be translated by the CA plugin into a result object, uh, which goes back to Barbican Core and gets stored. Um, the order is updated. Certs are stored, and so on and so forth. Turns out that we we store the certs um, using the secret store interface, um, so they're actually stored. Uh, when you, when you get them back, you're actually getting back something that will be a reference to a secret. Um, eventually, we're going to get the order. We're going to retrieve the order and the certificates. Um, and we're ultimately going to send that back. Now, it's a little more complicated on, on, on the get side of things over there because, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we actually store the certs as, as secrets. And we aggregate those into some sort of container 
So the order will, will contain a reference to a container, which will then contain references to, to secrets, and then you get the secrets and then you get your certificate. But it's just a series of gets. Um, so uh, just to give you some idea as to some of the state of machine that's going on here, um, you could have opposed to orders um, that ultimately will call uh, issue certificate request on the plugin. Um, at that point, it may come back as, as, as pending. Um, and so we have a queue in which retry tasks in which tasks are, 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 are stored or queued up. Uh, so they'll run periodically and you'll get check certificate, uh, check certificate status, check certificate, it'll check it periodically. Um, and then once you actually have a certificate or you have an error, it'll come out of that, uh, store the certificate and then ultimately later when the client goes to get the order and ultimately goes to get the secret, um, you're gonna get your certificate. So there's a, there's a um, a state machine that's in there that's within Barbican Core that manages this, this whole operation. So uh, just a little bit about dog tags. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the dog tag certificate plugin in particular. Um, uh, dog tag, in case you don't know, is the, is the upstream version of the Red Hat certificate server. Um, it's been used in some of the largest deployments uh, in the world, millions of keys, millions of certs. It's been around for I don't know, 10, 12, 13 years, I guess. Um, it, is, uh, it does interact with a bunch of HSMs through PKCS11. Um, it's Common Criteria Certified, which um, if you've been through Common Criteria Certification, means you've been through a long and painful uh, process of, of certifying that you have all the required uh, auth authentication, authorization, uh, auditing, um, that kind of thing, signed audits, uh, so that the, the audit, audit log is tamper-proof and so on. Um, as well as making sure that uh, secrets, for example, that go through are never in the clear, even in memory. Um, so uh, Nick mentioned the, the wrapping thing. Um, so this, in, in the case of dog tag, you have a transport key, which is a public key, which is used to wrap the secret on the client side, and, and therefore um, it cannot be decrypted until it eventually gets into the HSM um, where your dog tag system uh, resides and then it, it automatically, immediately gets re-encrypted and stored um, so that it's never out in the clear um, in memory anywhere. It's only in the HSM. Um, so um, there's two components of the dog tag system that, that are important uh, for our case here. There's the certificate authority, which is, issues the certificates, uh, and the key recovery authority, which is used to be the component that just stored uh, private keys, but we've extended it to extort uh, just about anything, um, you know, any kind of secret, private keys, uh, uh, symmetric keys, uh, and so on. Um, and there are many, for the dog tag plugin, there are many different types of certificates that are available. Uh, the server cert, user cert, based on what certificate profile you have. The profile uh, within dog tag talk is basically <laughs> uh, a thing that maps towards a type of certificate. So it, it will uh, specify the types of inputs that you need on the certificate. It will specify how to uh, create the subject EN, um, any kinds of extensions that are available in that, uh, and that kind of thing. And of course, uh, it comes automatically with a bunch of different profiles, but you can specify uh, uh, custom profiles to get whatever you want in your certificate. Um, and uh, the dog tag plugins uh, are set up to interact directly from Barbican to the CA and the KRA uh, with a trusted user so that you automatically can get your certificate approved so you don't have to wait um, after. So just as an example of how this will work, um, you would do a post to Barbican to the orders interface, um, and the body of that is gonna be, it's gonna be a type of certificate. Uh, the green parts over there are the parameters that are gonna be passed in, um, and I mentioned those in particular, profile ID, you know, suit request, and so on. Those are specific dog tag parameters that are there. Uh, and the reason that they're specific dog tag parameters is that in Juno, these parameters are just passed directly to the plugin and those are passed directly to the CA. Um, and so dog tag knows what to do about that. And so you ha if you happen to know that you have a dog tag CA at the back end, you can do everything uh, that you would ordinarily be able to do with dog tag. Um, Barbican essentially proxies it through, uh, does the authentication with Keystone and then, and then proxies it through for you. Um, in Kilo, uh, we're going to add an API to allow you to generate, any to not even know what CA is behind there. Um, so you can get certain simple kinds of certificates and so on by specifying these, these the parameters which will then have to be translated by the plugins to whatever the appropriate plugin interface is. 
Okay? And there's a design session that will be coming up later uh, this week on, on that specific thing. So if you're interested in that, please, uh, please attend. Um, and once you do that, you get your order. Order, again, contains a container reference at the, bof at the bottom over there. Get your container. And then you, have, you can see you have a series of secret references over here. Get those secrets. One of them is going to be your, your certificate. You get that secret, and there it is. Um, so with that, I'll there you go. Appreciate it, Alex. So talk briefly about the notification plugins that we're using. Oops, excuse me. Talk briefly about the uh, notification plugins that we're using within Barbican. Um, and so the idea that we're, we're taking right now is to have kind of domain specific, you know, specific to workflows within Barbican. Uh, an interface that has you know natural methods on it that makes sense for that workflow, um, and then leave to the implementation exactly how to create tasks and, and enqueue them or whatever it needs to do as far as the implementation is concerned. So you can see in this example we have a notify certificate is ready, so we would use that as far, part of our certificate workflow to, to surface those sort of events. And so your choices right now, you know, we're, we're thinking. Uh, Oslo Messaging Notifier is used in projects like Nova, and so that would be a natural uh, plugin to, to implement and use. We could also, you know, folks could, could make their own plugin to adapt to whatever corporate system that they have, for corporate ticketing or whatnot. Customized system lo systems logged, system logs, we might use that, for example, in Barbican to surface events that associate a knowledge article with, with an exception, perhaps. And, and allow admins to have an easier way of, of maintaining and, and troubleshooting Barbican. And multiple of these events could be installed at a time. So you know, I could say notify certificate event, and, and if there's three plugins, three certificate event plugins installed, it would fire off all three of those. And so let's get into the challenges then for, for, for Kilo then. Uh, uh, multiple plugins versus one. Um, if the minute you have multiple plugins installed, you need some means for, for selecting which one to use. And so we've already talked about the supports method as, as one option for that. Migration between backends. Let's say you have a bunch of secret stores stored with an HSM and you want to convert over to, to KMEP or dog tag. Well, what do you do with those old secrets? Do you migrate them in, in mass? Do you maintain the HSM, both, both plugins effectively and only for new secrets to use the KMIP? Um, those sort of things. Um, with, that we need to discuss. And I, I mentioned through my anecdote about the HSM plugin, you know, versioning within a plugin is, is something we'll have to definitely contend with. And then as Adi mentioned on the certificate plugins, there, there, if you have multiple plugins that are working with multiple CAs, you need some way for clients to discover which of those plugins they want to use. And, uh, and so that's something that we want to discuss as well. Uh, as well as common parameters across those CAs, identifying those and standardizing those if possible. And so Tuesday is going to be a big day for, for the Barbican project, um, starting with a, a wonderful workshop, hour and a half workshop, uh, Barbican Securing Your Secrets. If you want to really get your hands dirty with the API, please, please attend that. There's also going to be a tech talk given by uh, Joel, um, Securing Data at Rest. And then we have four design sessions. Integrating Barbican with other OpenStack projects, as I mentioned. If you if you have an integration use case with Barbican, please please come to this. Uh, common certificate issuance. This is all about CAs and trying to come up with that that uh, search discovery API, for example. Uh, driver lifetime management. That gets into all the versioning issues that we were talking about, as 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 well as you know any any other issues related to managing plugins. And finally. Um, a per user entity level RBAC. So um, trying to find, tr trying to make a, a more fine grain access control for RBAC, or for RBAC and, and Barbican. So maybe a per secret RBAC would be better than just using trust at a, at a project level, for example. And so we do have an etherpad. Please uh, go out there and, and view, you know, what, feel free to view what, we, what we've identified as issues for Barbican so far. We're going to have a table. If you have questions, please come on by. And finally, this, these are the, the folks that made things happen today for the presentation. Um, feel free to contact us with any of these uh, mechanisms or talk to us after the, after the conference. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, guys.